right, so class one integer rhythmics are definitely the most complicated. So let's just get these out of the way first. Now, the first thing that you have to know about class one anti rhythmics overall is that they're gonna, they're gonna block the sodium channels. Specifically, they're gonna block those fast sodium channels that we talked about. Now remember, the fast sodium channels are gonna be the ones that are gonna be doing the depolarization, the phase zero depolarization in ventricular myocytes. So if you're blocking that phase, right, you would expect, you know, off the bat, you would expect that depolarization to maybe take a little bit longer. Intuitively, to me, that kind of makes sense, okay? And so that's why these class 1A antiarrhythmics are pretty easy to understand because it makes sense that you would kind of delay that first phase. The class 1A antiarrhythmics are actually right in the middle, okay? So in terms of, you know, we'll talk about the type of blockade we get at these sodium channels. These class 1As, you can see, there's gonna be a moderate blockade. So the way I think about these is like, if I just had a drug that blocked sodium channels, class 1A is kind of like your typical drug that blocks sodium channels. This is like the normal drug that blocks sodium channels. And then class 1B and 1C would be either one that is not as good at blocking the sodium channels or one that's better at blocking the sodium channels. But class 1A is kind of like your standard, typical, sodium channel blocker, okay? So think of it that way. So in the non-pacemaker cells, like we said, it's going to have moderate blockade of the fast sodium channels. So you can see that here. Because I have a blockade of sodium channels, I have a delayed uh, ventricular action potential here. Now, the other thing that these antiarrhythmics do is they also will block, they're also going to block potassium channels, okay? So they're not only gonna block the sodium channels, but they're also gonna block potassium channels. Now, because they also block potassium channels, you get this curve kind of shifted over a little bit. Or you can think of it kind of curving out like this. You know, whatever is easier for you. And so not only do we delay this ventricular depolarization, we also delay the repolarization. So because we're delaying both, right, what would we expect to see here? So the first thing is we have an increased action potential duration, right? Because it's gonna take longer to depolarize and longer to repolarize, okay? Because we're blocking these two channels. That makes sense. Longer action potential duration. And you'll see when the action potential duration is extended, remember from phase zero to phase three, when that time frame is extended from here to here, if you can see the red curve, it has a longer amount of time than the black curve, right? The black curve is your normal. The red curve is after you get the, the class 1A antiarrhythmic you can see that it's delayed. When you see this delay at those two points, that means that there is going to be some QT prolongation. Because remember, this area represents the QT interval, okay? When that area is extended, there's gonna be QT prolongation. If that area is shortened, there's gonna be QT shortening, okay? And this is gonna have some significance because remember in the last video we said QT prolongation can predispose the patient to torsades. And that's very serious. Okay, now the other thing is there's going to be some widening of the QRS. Why is that? If this curve here, the ventricular uh, depolarization, if that slope is decreased like you see here, that's going to cause that QRS to take a little bit longer in terms of its depolarization, right? Because that phase zero is synonymous with the QRS. Okay, so like I said, if you understand how these are all related, you can actually interpret a lot of this information. So if I block sodium channels, right, and I block a little bit of potassium channels, I'm gonna increase the action potential duration. That's gonna widen the QT. I'm gonna slow down my ventricular depolarization. That's gonna widen my QRS. Now there's three major drugs to remember here and all for different reasons. So quinidine is probably the biggest one overall in terms of when you're thinking class 1A, quinidine is actually very classic. And it really has this unique set of effects known as synchronism. So synchronism is usually gonna be a series of symptoms. It can be tinnitus, it can be headache, hearing, vision loss. Um, you know, I just think of like everything up here, everything in the head is kind of like synchronism. That's just like my way of remembering. I'm thinking vision loss, hearing loss, um, tinnitus, psychosis, cognitive impairment. Those are all things that are associated with synchronism. So everything kind of up in the cephalad region, if that helps you remember it, the C and cephalad, the C and synchronism uh, being associated with quinidine. Now, procainamide is big to remember for other reasons. So procainamide is associated with drug-induced lupus. So drug-induced lupus has to do with a presentation that's very similar to lupus, very classically. You can have that the malar rash, bearing of the nasolabial folds. Those are all very classic um, for lupus in general. And I'm not gonna go through a whole lupus presentation here just because we don't really have time for that in this video, but procainamide is associated with this lupus-like presentation and that's known as drug-induced lupus. And the big thing about drug-induced lupus is these patients will classically have antihistone 
antibodies, okay? So when you see antihistone antibodies, about 90 to 95% of patients that have drug-induced lupus have those antibodies. So when you see that, think about drug-induced lupus. Now, drug-induced lupus, the big three that I want you to remember is gonna be isoniazide, hydralazine, and procainamide. Kind of a random set of three uh, drugs here, but these come up very classically. These are actually particularly high yield uh, as causing drug-induced lupus. And remember, the thing you're looking for is a lupus-like presentation with antihistone antibodies. It's very classic. And in terms of the class one antiarrhythmics, I think these are the big two to remember. You know, I don't wanna get into too much of the weeds of this other material here, but I think these are quinidine and procainamide are gonna be your big two. Lidocaine is definitely your biggest one for class 1B. Just remember, anti-epileptics can also show up. Phenytone is the classic one, um, you know, but these three are, are very classic for being class 1B. And the difference is, remember, I said like class 1A is kind of like your standard, um, you know, sodium blocker. These are going to be, class 1B is going to be the weak sodium blocker. So think of, again, class 1A is like your standard, and class 1B is going to be your weaker sodium channel blocker. So if it's weaker, we're not really going to see a huge change in the slope here because, again, this we have some change in the slope here because we have a moderate blockade. If I'm barely blocking any of these channels, I'm not really going to see a huge change in phase zero. I might see a little bit of a slope decrease, but it's going to be pretty minor overall, usually going to be negligible in board questions. But the thing that you do see is you actually see a shortened QT interval. And that's because, again, look at this difference here. The, your repolarization actually happens faster with class 1B drugs typically. This situation that you're seeing here where you get this faster, earlier repolarization is going to be primarily going to be when we have a very high efficacy of the drug. Right? We're going to get this effect when we have a high efficacy of the drug. When will you have a high efficacy of class 1B antiarrhythmics? In the setting of ischemia. So if in a board question they tell you that you know, your patient recently had a myocardial infarction and now they have a ventricular arrhythmia and they're giving you options as to which is the best antiarrhythmic, very classically it's going to be 1B. So one of the biggest things I would remember about class 1B is that they are primarily going to be the uh, antiarrhythmics that are frequently chosen for patients that have myocardial infarctions, ischemia, structural heart disease. And the part of the reason for that is because they actually function really, really well in that environment. They have very weak binding to some of these different receptors. But the thing is, when you have ischemic myocardium, what happens is you're actually going to increase your resting potential, right? If I have ischemia, this potential actually increases. Okay, my resting potential does if I have recently had a myocardial infarction. And this increased resting potential will actually, because it's so much higher, it will actually delay the transition of your sodium channels that are gonna to have to undergo depolarization, right? Those sodium channels, after they undergo depolarization and they come back down, they go into an inactivated state when you're in a resting potential and then you have to depolarize again at some point. And so normally what would happen is, you know, you'd get some depolarization, right? You get some repolarization, your sodium channels would be inactivated okay and then before you had another depolarization they would enter a resting state so in other words a resting state means they can depolarize they're not inactivated right they can still depolarize in the resting state but they haven't reached they haven't got a stimulus in their environment to depolarize and that's going to be your resting state right so this is the resting state this is the inactivated state when you have a higher resting potential like you do here this this is going to actually get delayed a little bit okay so normally your inactivating state might be here and your resting state might be here and so you can conduct another potential right away by separating these two in ischemic myocardia right where they have a higher resting potential this drug prevents arrhythmias from happening by kind of separating these two apart so you don't get into like a ventricular tachycardia situation by delaying the time it takes to go from inactivated to a resting state if that makes sense now you don't have to know all the details on that, but I think sometimes just understanding this a little bit actually helps it make sense. Okay, so that's what's happening. These drugs are, are increasing the gap between inactivation of sodium channels and the resting state of sodium channels at higher resting potentials that you see in MIs. Okay, that's where they work the best. So that's why they're using that situation. Now, if we just go back to this curve and kind of go back to our basics, again, we can make sense of this, right? There's a decrease in the action potential duration. What does that mean for you? That means a shortened QT interval, right? Because there's less time between phase zero and the end of phase three, okay? And that means there's gonna be more time in diastole. And you could get some QRS prolongation here, but I wouldn't particularly hold my hat on that because remember, you're having very weak 
binding of these sodium channels. So just in general, right, for all class one antiarrhythmics, you would expect there to be some level of QRS widening or QRS prolongation because you're inhibiting sodium channels. That's ventricular depolarization, right, this phase right here. Um, but it's going to be the smallest effect here with the class 1B. Okay, so now when we move to class 1C, wrapping this up here, so flecainide is a big, big class 1C antiarrhythmic, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So think of class 1A as kind of your, your normal one, and in this side would be a stronger sodium bl uh, channel blocker, this side would be weaker. Okay, so remember, class 1B is going to be over here, it's kind of the weaker one, and the stronger sodium channel blocker is going to be the 1C. Okay, so 1C is going to be very strong. So you can see this really low slope here. Okay, very delayed phase zero here. We don't have much of the potassium channel blockade or we don't have a faster repolarization. It's kind of just in the middle in terms of its ventricular repolarization. So what does that mean? Well, we started here and we ended here, right? We didn't really change our QT interval from the black curve. It's actually the same. So there's really no significant change in the QT interval on uh, class 1C antiarrhythmics. And I said there's exceptions that ex exist, but in general, that's how I want you to remember it. Okay, and again, you get QRS prolongation, but that's probably the most significant QRS prolongation with class 1C. So a great board question would be to test your knowledge on when do you get QRS prolongation or QRS widening, and when do you get QT prolongation or QT shortening, or is the QT usually unchanged? based on the antiarrhythmic, right? So this should make sense to you. If you kind of just remember this, you can pretty much figure all of this out. Now, the last thing I wanna hit on here is that class 1C antiarrhythmics are contraindicated in ischemic heart disease. Okay, so this is the opposite as class 1B. Remember, class 1B have really good efficacy on ischemic heart disease, class 1C, not so much. Now you can see here, overall, like I said, there's really not gonna be any significant change in the QT. Now, one kind of exception to this, if you really want to make sure you have this down, is in general, like we said, no major change in the action potential duration, no significant change in the QT interval, but for flecainide, which is kind of like your classic 1C antiarrhythmic, you actually can get a little bit of action potential uh, increase in terms of duration. So flecainide can actually push this out a little bit and slightly give you a little bit of an increase in the QT interval. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. So if a question is testing you between class 1C antiarrhythmics, and a patient you know, has a concern for QT prolongation, flecainide would not be the first choice. To me, that's pretty extreme. I think that you know that would be a, a much more difficult question. Usually they don't go into that much detail. Okay, so the last thing on here is this concept of use dependence, which actually comes up occasionally. So the idea here is, is because the 1B are so much weaker, okay, they're gonna have very weak binding, right? And then the 1C are gonna be much stronger. They're gonna have very strong binding. Remember, 1A is kind of right in the middle. So the concept of this use dependence is basically saying, look, if you have faster heart rates, okay, so as the heart rate goes up, okay, then there's less time that the heart is essentially going to be resting. The less time that these sodium channels are going to be in a resting state. Essentially, an easy way to think about it is if the heart rate is up, there's going to be less time for the drug to disassociate from the receptor. And so the more blocking right? If you have less time to disassociate, then the more time, every time you go through another set of heartbeats, another cardiac cycle, right? There's going to be more and more blocking at the receptor. So that's the idea of use dependence. So as the heart rate goes up, the drug tends to get more effective because there's less time to disassociate from the receptor. Now, this is actually a little bit more complicated. It has to do with the amount of time sodium channels spend open in the inactivated states. And um, I'm not gonna go into all the details on that because that's not particularly high yield, but the idea of use dependence is at higher heart rates, less time to disassociate, more blocking. That's the general concept. Now, because class 1B has very weak binding, they're gonna disassociate from the receptor pretty quickly. And so for that reason, class 1B are not as affected by high heart rates, okay? Because in general, they have fast disassociation, so you don't get, you're not gonna get an exponential increase, you know, more and more and more blocking, because either way, they're disassociating pretty quickly. Now, if you had something that disassociated very slow, right, and then you and you decrease the time that it has to disassociate, now you're going to see a huge increase, right, in the amount of receptors that are bound over time because they're not going to disassociate very fast, and you've also closed the window on the time they have to disassociate. So everything is going to start sticking to those receptors, right? So at really high heart rates, you're going to get slow disassociation. That's going to result in more binding, and this is great, great, great for terminating 
tachyarrhythmias. If somebody's tachy, right, they have a really high heart rate. Say they have, you know, a, a heart rate that's way up in the 160s or the 170s, right, and you give them one of these drugs that has really good use dependence that's really strong binding, you're going to bind up all those receptors because there's no time to disassociate. And on top of that, it has slow disassociation in this class 1C class. So everything is going to basically be bound. You're going to get a really strong effect from your medication. The downside to this is if you get too much binding, right, you go past the point of efficacy and you go to over treating. That's the general concept of this slide. I know that's a lot of information, but hopefully this will at least give you some framework into thinking about these. Now, again, if you're just sitting here and you're saying, there's no way I'm going to remember all this, just start here, okay? Draw this out, 1A is in the middle, 1C, 1B, remember they inhibit sodium channels of the ventricular action potential, and this is the first step, just knowing what happens to the QRS. For 1A, right, I'm pushing everything out this way, right? For 1B, I'm going that way. And for 1C, we're staying where we are with the repolarization, okay? If you know that, you can figure out pretty much almost everything else. And by drawing this out, you're actually telling yourself what has weak binding and what has strong binding. Something has strong binding, it's going to disassociate slowly. That makes intuitive sense, right? If something's bound very tightly, it's going to take longer to disassociate. And so that's how you can figure out the use dependence as well.